Yeah, really what I'm doing now and have been doing my whole life is theater. I've been um, doing theater and that's got, um, it's taken a lot of different forms. I got involved as a, a, a maybe a 13 year old, a teenager certainly, um, when I didn't get on the basketball team in eighth grade or ninth grade and I uh, walked through a door in the school that I'd never gone through, I don't know quite why, and I found a guy there making magenta fingernails that were like six inches long out of cardboard. And I, I sat down and I helped him. And it was a play, they were for a play about ancient China, uh, about the book burning in ancient China, and it was written by the monk who ran the theater program or theater program, who did plays there at the school. So that's how I got into theater. I walked through the store and I made these fingernails. And we made little books too, little scrolls. Uh, one of the sight gags in the... My, fir my first job in the theater was props in this, in this, in this guy's play. Uh, and he had a sight gag where the scholar had different scrolls of different sizes, like five different sizes. He had one little one, he wrote a little little book that was a scroll, and then a bigger one, and a bigger one, and then finally one that rolled all the way across the stage. And we had to make these scrolls and fill them with fake Chinese characters. So that was one job of it. So that's how I got into theater. And for a couple of years, I just did tech, because I, I didn't think I wanted to be out there. And then I got out there, and um, um, one of my first parts was and Midsummer Night's Dream, I played flute, and I, uh, who's the, the guy in the troupe who plays the woman, uh, Francis Flute, the bellows mender, and he, uh, and I got this big laugh, because he comes out dressed as a girl, and this was a big joke. But then also I found that I had timing in my lines. I knew how to, I knew exactly how to time the lines. I knew just what to do. I was there. Uh, asleep, my love, what dead, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise, arise, speak, speak, quite dumb. Dead, dead, a tomb must cover thy sweet eyes, these lily lips, this cherry... Anyway, this got a big laugh uh, as a 14-year-old or 15-year-old boy saying it, dressed in a dress in the high school auditorium. And that, that laugh, really, I remember as the thing that, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very seductive, and I really liked it, and, and I became dedicated to theater really at that age and had a really wonderful couple, three, four years with this monk teaching me all about theater. And he was a really smart guy and a really wonderful man. Um, I actually, in my wallet I have a picture of him, but I, we won't do that for now. Uh, I carry around a picture of this guy because he affected my life so deeply. Uh, and I've done theater ever since. And first I learned theater in a kind of academic way. I learned plays, I learned play history, theater history, and I, I did, uh, you know, Ben Johnson and uh, Congreve, or I can't remember, all, all those classic plays. Uh, uh, just thinking of one, what was it? Um, can't remember it. Anyway, we d we did plays, and I did plays. I did that for like ten years into my twenties. Uh, I went through school and college, and then I toured, and I did summer stock um, as an apprentice. Then I did summer stock as a company member. I was in Dracula, and I was in The Odd Couple. I played Judd in Oklahoma, and all those all those different experiences as a young theater nerd. Really, I really had no other interest in my life outside of these plays. Um, that I was learning, um, that I learned how to do with the monk. Father Stephen was his name. Um, and then I lost interest. I really went kind of dead on it. Well, what happened was after the, after the touring, I toured professionally, uh, doing mid Midsummer again and also the Oristaya. Uh, we toured every state east of the Mississippi and some others. Uh, for a year, and um, and then I was drafted. I was drafted into the army in '69, and 
I had already really started to lose interest in those classic plays. I'd kind of, I kind of wrung out that um, interest of mine that had started there as a, as an actor. Uh, the ro the romance of it had gone away, and so I, when when I came to Minneapolis, after the army, um, which was for a girlfriend actually, which is another whole story. Um, I I was interested in theater. I'd done a lot of theater. I felt I was very actually good at it as an actor. Uh, but I wasn't so interested in the old theater, those old plays that people did in the 60s, 70s. Um, and really, when I came to Minneapolis, there very few new plays were being done, very, very few. Uh, and, and so what happened to me in Minneapolis is I got into experimental theater, as they called it then, and what it was was we made up plays, and, we, and I had figured out from my readings in psychology as an actor. I had studied the actor's method, Stanislavski's method, which is uh, the Russian revolutionary director from the turn of the previous century, 1900, with Chekhov, invented a whole new kind of theater based on, and I realized this, I was studying it, I, I had studied it in college, and I'd studied his books, The Actor Prepares and uh, Building a Character, Stanislavski's method, um, kind of a scientific approach to acting uh, of a certain sort. I realized, oh, I said, and I, ha I remember I was walking on in Seven Corners. I was in a play. The first play I was in in Minneapolis after the Army was Scuba Duba at uh, Theater in the Round. And John Fenn directed it, and Bill Siemens was the lead. And I got into it, and Bill Siemens, when it was just starting the Cricket Theater, and John Fenn had just come from New York and was working at the Guthrie, and uh, Scuba Duba was a crappy little uh, Hollywood uh, comedy. And I was thinking about acting, and I, I was bored with acting, and I, you know, and, and I thought, oh, but uh, I had this little glimmer of insight about Stanislavski's. Uh, acting method is ba was based really on the Freudian insights of the late of the late I'm, I'm now mixed up with late 19th century Freud's insights about the unconscious were coming to light you know For, and he wasn't the only one but all everybody was kind of realizing oh all this surface the surface idea of what we are as humans is a surface and you can look under the surface at something more real about us humans. And you can break it down in a lot of different ways. And Freud did, and then there was Jung, and then and all of Freud's uh, offspring, and, and, and the, the people parallel to Freud. A lot of people were discovering this at the same time. And I would say including Marx, you know, that whole uh, study of what humanity is up to. Um, and I thought, Okay, so Stanislavski had an acting method based on basically Freud. He didn't base it on Freud, but it's the same body of knowledge. It was the, it was the newest set of knowledge about humanity uh, that was abroad at the time. And he, and he started studying classic plays, and I read many books in high school, many, several, certainly, about him directing. Stanislavski directs, and, and I, was, I marveled at the amount of realism he brought to Othello, say, and studying what the crowd in the first Othello scene, what would be, what, how you would bring that to life. And, and I read about the Stanislavski, the, the Moscow Art Theater, and how they brought these things to life, and I thought that was marvelous. And, and yet, so then I thought, but then I had, I had read uh, more recently in the Army, well, actually, I read Freud in the Army. I read an Interpretation of Dreams, but that's that's intellectual history, uh, kind of parallel to my theater history. Um, I had read a book called uh, Gestalt Therapy, which is a collection of writings about a new kind of therapy developed in California, I think, by Franz Pearl, Pearls and I'm forgetting the names. Nor will know all the names of all the Gestalt Therapy people, and it was a really a different. Uh, sort of therapy, a different sort of psychology 
based not on analyzing the subconscious and the conscious and the superego and the id and all that, that whole Freudian look at it, analysis. It was based on getting to the, as I understood it at the time, and it wasn't well, it was out of a couple books, you know. Uh, it was based on based on studying the, the person, the humanity itself, you know, our urges our, and our animal urges and getting in touch with the whole uh, gestalt of being human, which, which uh, m more holistic, really. It didn't divide the, the physical from the mental or the psychological so much. Anyway, and I thought, now this is something that's worth doing. I mean, I didn't even think this is worth doing. I went, Oh, I'm interested in developing a kind of acting and a kind of theater that that is built not on the Freudian model, but on um, a different psychological model, Gestalt, or even, I don't even remember what I was doing at the time, uh, but but I, th I had this insight that acting, the art of acting, and the whole art of theater... Uh, because, after all, I'd learned theater as acting and tech and playwriting and directing all in one ball of wax from this monk, because he did them all. He designed it, and, and, he, and he wrote that first play that I, that I worked on. And I saw him write the play, and I studied playwriting with him without even knowing I was studying playwriting, uh, because we edited a Ben John We did Ben Johnson's uh, The Alchemist, and we would do that. I was 15, 16 years old, and he kind of caught on to me that I was a smart kid. And, uh, well, he did this with all the kids, but he did it with me, certainly. Uh, uh, we traded scenes. It, it was too... Ben, Johnson's, ben Johnson overwrites. He writes just piles and piles and lines and lines and lines, many unneeded lines. And so what we did... It was. He, he, we traded off scenes and cut the play, cut the Ben Johnson play. I was 15 or 16, and, and he would do one scene, and I caught on to how, it, and he said, you try the next scene. I, I took it home, and I would take home every other scene, and I would type it up on, on mimeograph paper for the cast to mimeograph off uh, copies, and I would cut, I would cut extraneous uh, verbiage. And thereby, I learned playwriting because I learned within that play there was an action, <laughs> and I learned how to go to the action and trim away everything else, and so I had learned playwriting that way. So now I'm on the West Bank and I'm wandering around Seven Corners uh, as a ex uh, GI, uh, uh, kind of pissed off uh, hippie. Um, and I thought, well, now that, that's really interesting. We could, you can base a theater, you can base a, a kind of acting, an acting theory and a whole theory of theater on any psychological theory you come up with, you know, and I'm interested now in gestalt and the animal urges of the human. So that's, that's really what I would, I'm interested in developing a kind of theater that would fit with this kind of psychology. So that's what I then, uh, it, there are many to and fro's about this, because I then went to San Francisco for a few months. I drove out there, I lost the girlfriend. Um, she had actually dumped me before I got here, um, but that's another story. Uh, and I went to San Francisco, where I wish I'd stayed, actually, but I didn't. Um, and out there, I was in a... a uh, a couple different productions, only one of which happened. And I found this out about, a, quote, experimental theater, because there on North Beach I found uh, uh, an audition notice, right? And uh, the audition notice was for the lesson by uh, Ionesco. So I, oh, I went and auditioned. And as it turns out, you know, they don't have a lot of people auditioning, or there wasn't a lot of quality people auditioning in a coffee shop on the North Beach. So I got the part, and I got this part, and I learned the whole part, and I did it with a with a really a she was really homeless I think the street woman, uh, and we we would meet and rehearse, and the director just kind of couldn't believe that we were actually doing it because that that he had an actor who was actually serious about doing it. I was very serious about doing it. I learned the lines, and I 
was really good at it, and we we did the whole thing. But he hadn't really planned to produce it. He was just planning. I think he put up an audition notice. Who knows why, right? And I found this out about theater and experimental theater. There's a whole side of of uh, flim flam about it, you know, people saying they're going to do something and not doing it. So there I am in San Francisco, and the, and but the show that did happen was was an operetta called Orpheus in the Underworld, where there was a French uh, French mime artist, I think. I don't well, a director from France who was doing this operetta, and I got into it, and I ended up there. Uh, much to my parents' chagrin, doing a nude can-can in, because Orpheus in the under, uh, they got a review called Orpheus in the under, in his underwear, because uh, we were, well, anyway, because the devils come out and do the can-can, that's the original can-can, da 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 that's, that's where the can-can was invented, uh, was for the devils in the underworld of Orpheus in the underworld of this operetta. And we came out, and there was, you know, like 30 or 40 of us, uh, naked and black light and painted and so the adventures of theater so at any rate when i get back to minneapolis i'm really at very much at loose ends because i've returned to the same girlfriend who is we're trying it again um and what happened well i ended up i ended up actually i ended up auditioning for a thing at walker church um that was well two things first i was in first i was in a play that bain belkey was directing at walker church and he was working at the children's theater and he was directing a play in the summer and he was directing uh the cherry orchard um no no seagull the seagull uh Chekhov's the seagull and i got into that and um boy i learned a lot about acting from bain that one production and um, and so that led into another theater that was at Walker Church, which is Minnesota Ensemble Theater. Joey Walsh was directing it, directed that. that. And and I was in a production of uh, Every Man for him. That was <laughs> and and I and I played Riches, and I played Riches. He, I wanted it to do anyway. He made me. He, his idea was Riches would do a belly dance, that Riches was a belly dance seductor. And so I did that, and uh, and I learned how to do a belly dance, and I wore a skirt, and I had a veil, and I came out in my skirt, and, uh, and it was a big hit. Uh, I, I was a big hit, and then I started to get parts all around town, you know, because they'd see that, and they, they saw I was a good actor, and I... And I did a lot of different things, and then I ended up doing experimental theater eventually. Uh, and eventually, the Palace Theater broke off of the Minnesota Ensemble Theater because Joey Walsh. Um, I'm I'm testing my words very carefully here. He was a rapist who was convicted, and I can say that because I talked to his victim, uh, and I hear he's now in Paris uh, working as an actor. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, anyway, um, so due to the uproar over that criminality of Joey Walsh, which is a little more complex than that, he, um, uh, a couple theaters broke off, and this is also endemic to all experimental theaters and new theaters, is they, you know, they, they morph. It was really more at the, in those days, in the days, this is the early 70s of Minneapolis, there really weren't a lot of new plays being done. There were a few, every once in a while, but mostly people did old plays. And there were a number of theaters that did old plays, like Theater in the Round, and like, anyway, uh, or the Guthrie, or, uh, and then, but we were, I was right at the beginning then of this explosion of theater in Minneapolis. It's really been exponential since then. Uh, we had an office, we, we, the Palace Theater started out of that, and a couple other theaters started out of the death of the Minnesota Ensemble Theater, uh, and, and it was really right at the cusp of everybody all of a sudden decided they could be playwrights, or wanted to be playwrights, or wanted to write plays, or do theater, and so they all started doing it. And, uh, you know, the next year there were a dozen, and then in the 80s there were you know, I don't know, dozens of theaters, 
well, I shouldn't say that, a dozen theaters. In the 90s, there were dozens of theaters, and now there are probably hundreds <laughs> uh, with the growth of things like the Fringe. So I have witnessed in my time here in Minneapolis, in the Twin Cities, this explosion of theater, and it's really pretty interesting. Uh, I just read an article this last week in City Pages about a guy who's teaching acting for theater coup d'etat, I think it's called. I might have that wrong. Uh, where he's, he teaches people to act from an animal base. They go out and be animals. And it really made me laugh because 40 years ago, uh, Jim Stoll, who was part of the early palace, as was Bain and a number of people, uh, Jim would take us out and we went out and, and were animals. We, well, I can't remember what we called it. What we called the exercise, we'd spend five, six, seven hours all day in Eloise Butler in Worth Park. Uh, one person being hunted and the others hunting us. You know, hunt, you know, one person would be, he would, you know, he would give you five minutes to go, go run away and then somebody would come hunt you. I mean, the crowd would, you know, and that was the acting exercise for the day. And I still remember doing that as I did it from both sides. Um, because basically the lead would then be the hunted, and I, Jim had, never mind, I won't go into, Jim's plays had a form that were really quite beautiful, uh, and he did beautiful plays there in Walker Church, and I was in a couple, and, uh, so that, that was the kind of experimental theater we did, because then we started doing movement theater, uh, it, we, and that, that was the Palace Theater, was really based on, first on Jim's playwriting out of the Minnesota Ensemble, but then he was often busy over acting in the children's theater. He could get jobs. Uh, and, and so then I became a playwright in mid-70s, playwright director, and wrote my own plays. And really pursuing this insight that I had had uh, two, three years previous about, oh, there could be a whole way of acting based on a different psychology. And I really... Uh, so that, that's really how I ended up doing what I'm doing today. And I'll take you through a few more steps. <laughs> because back then, the thing we did is we did a ton of yoga, and I started studying Tai Chi back then uh, in 74. Well, that's an interesting story. The Tai Chi story is interesting because in 71, I came here out of the Army, and I was on the West Bank, and I worked as a janitor at the Cedar Theater for the for the Minnesota Dance Theater. John Lennerson uh, hired me. I was janitor there. Um, and, uh, and But then in that theater, now I'm going to have to try to remember why I brought, brought that up, but in that theater, uh, Grand Illusion Cinema uh, started, they started showing movies because the dance theater didn't use it all the time. And a, a church rented it on Sunday morning and the Grand Illusion Cinema rented it two or three nights a week and brought in some um, 36 mm uh, film projectors and projected films uh, of, you know, an art house. I remember one, one double header was Performa with, uh, no, Performance with uh, one of, uh, Persona. Persona, the Bergman with Performance, which is the one where where Mick Jagger plays a woman, I mean, it, very trippy. And the two of them as a double header, uh, and of course everybody's getting stoned all the time, you know, including the projectors are up there smoking dope and uh, watching these films, and it was, it was very trippy. So there was a lot of drugs around, and that was, but, oh, I remember Tai Chi. On the West Bank, Tai Chi, I was working as a janitor there at the, uh, Grand Illusion Cinema or at Minnesota Dance Theater and, and uh, I wandered into the Guild of Performing Arts which was which is in the building next to Palmer's which then years later became Bedlam uh, and the Guild of Performing Arts I wandered in there and there was a I remember that moment so clearly I walked into I could remember her name it was a woman who taught Tai Chi to Nancy Hauser's company. Nancy Hauser had her company there at the Guild, called the Hauser 
dance company, I think. Uh, she was German expressionist. Uh, she's a real, she was a real modern dancer, along with uh, Lois Holton, who ran Minnesota Dance Theater. So there was a, also a very fertile dance uh, uh, community, even then, starting even then, uh, which has also exploded in this town. Um, but anyway, I walked into Turner, Connie, Claire Turner, uh, Something, tur Claire, tur anyway, she went off then. Uh, I walked into her class and I saw everybody do the first move Tai Chi. And I thought at that time with those ideas I had of the kind of theater I wanted to do, I said, well, now that's a very useful group physical energy. And we can use, we, I could use that, you know. And I put it in my little thing. I've got to study Tai Chi, okay. Uh, Claire Tur Turner, it's a C first, it's not Connie Turner, it's something Turner. She went off to New, to New York and did and was Tai Chi uh, teacher for uh, Meredith Monk's troupe. Um, so that was another constant argument of mine on the West Bank in, those, in the early 70s. Uh, with all these people I knew, young people like me and and my uh, and the dancers in the different in the company. I studied dance then with Larry White, who went off to New York. Uh, he taught because he was fascinated with um, Martha Graham Graham technique, and he you would teach uh, Graham technique in the Dome Village in uh, Dinky Town, and I took dance from him twice a week as a piece of my uh, studying of uh, physical stuff. I would do yoga and I took dance and I did and then eventually Tai Chi but but Larry White went off to New York and I said don't leave do it here. Uh, that was my argument with everybody don't leave do it here and I really would say it repeatedly you know why are you leaving? Don't go there because I hadn't gone there in DC I had not gone to New York I had gone elsewhere you know, somewhere else. Because New York has plenty of dance, plenty of theater. That was my argument. You know, they don't need you. But Larry White went to New York and he ended up doing, uh, being in Martha Graham's company, you know, and doing solo. He, he developed solos. She developed solos with him. So it's quite a successful career. Beautiful, actually. That worked out for him. Tai Chi. Tai Chi. And then I was in San Francisco for a, uh, most of a year. And I saw Tai Chi out there again, and I went, oh, yeah, Tai Chi, I really should study that, and I really wish I had out there, because out there is a really wonderful, Ben Lowe is out there. Anyway, but I didn't. I came back here, and in 1974, I saw a sign that said, Tai Chi class, uh, study Tai Chi with Fred Lehrman, and I was in a gym at the U. I went, oh, this is my chance, and I went. And that's where I learned Tai Chi, and he would come once a month, he was from New York, and he studied with Cheng Man Cheng in New York. <clears throat> and he would come once a month and teach two classes. He would fly in and teach a class that day, and he'd teach a class the next day and fly out. And he was doing this around the country. He did it in Miami and Chicago and Denver. and uh, he, he was a, like a Johnny Appleseed of Tai Chi. Uh, and he ended up teaching at Naropa then. He started at Naropa, uh, which is where I ended up going. Um, to study Tai Chi further. I learned the form with him once a month. And I would take one class, because he would teach one move uh, the first day and another move the second day. So I would go and learn the two moves the second day to save money, $5 a class, right? I wouldn't take the first class, I'd take the second class. And, uh, and that's the way I learned Tai Chi. And it took like two years to learn the form. Um, and it, was, it has been useful, and I'm still doing it. And it's quite useful now, even. Uh, so then we did this physical theater called the Palace Theater. And uh, for me, it was based on the kind of plays that I wrote out of the physical activities that I put people through. I put people through a kind of basic training of movement and acting. And, uh, and I would, I would ha write the plays around whoever showed up. I would put up an audition notice and people would come, and if they showed up, and if they stuck with it for a couple weeks, 
then they were in the play, and I would write the play about them uh, or about using them as actors. And I would teach them how to act because most of them, or many of them, didn't know any. They, they were complete beginners. So I really studied acting in that way. Well, what? Because I was pretty good by then, uh, and but a lot of good actors don't know how to do it. Uh, you don't know why you're good, you know. So I really had to study what made acting good, and I speech and movement and presence and story and character and all those things. So I developed a whole acting um, method around that. First of all, that insight about psychology, about the more things I could learn about humanity, the more I could put into the theater. And then um, insight of, uh, from, from teaching people who didn't know how to act, how to act, so they could do my plays. So, from there, then the Palace Theater lasted 10 years, 74 to 84, and uh, it was in the Walker Church. We did shows at the Walker, we did shows at the Guild. I did my first play at the Guild of Performing Arts uh, in, the, in the space that later became the Bedlam Theater, which is really a renowned theater later in the 90s and thousands, or in the, yeah, much later. Uh, and uh, and we, so we acted around about, and then we had a warehouse space <clears throat> down a block from the, from the courthouse next to the little wagon. It was in an old warehouse that we found uh, that, had housed, that had housed a factory for artificial limbs. It had a big sign, and, and uh, evidently, I never went, I don't believe, I didn't go to the basement where there were a bunch of artificial limbs, evidently. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's where we did our rehearsal, and I um, often ended up sleeping there because I often ended up without an apartment or uh, a room because everything was really quite um, uh, broke. I was, oh, never had any money for it because there was no money in this. So it was really uh, the, the life of, an act, of a theater monk, you know. Uh, it's really all I did was that. And... Uh, and girlfriends, you know, uh, romance, romance and art. Uh, and, uh, oh, oh, another little sideline, because I, because brought up by this housing crisis that I'm revisiting now, these couple decades, from 74 to 94, really. Uh, well, I shouldn't say, no, no, about a decade of, of really, uh, in and out of homeless, really, staying in rooming houses or, Renting apartments and then and then never having jobs or working very odd jobs uh, like night night work at the French fry factory in in uh, Prospect Park and things like that. So oh, the rooming houses around Elliott Park, really a fascinating scene. And I was I stayed in three or four or five different ones. There's, these were old mansions that are around Elliott Park that are mostly not there anymore because mostly it's been turned into high-rises for, um, for old folks, mostly subsidized housing. Uh, but, but there were a bunch of old mansions that, were, that nobody wanted as houses anymore, so it had been turned into rooming houses. And you could get, I could get a room for $10 a month, you know, with a refrigerator down the hall, shared bathroom, and very interesting characters. Uh, old drunks, and I realized one of those rooming houses, there were like, it was really pretty low down. There were a lot of old drunks in those rooms, uh, and bad smells in the hallways, you know. It was really pretty, pretty awful, and I realized, and then down on 15th and Chicago, or 14th, 6th, 15th and Chicago, I think, there was a big red stone building that was full of rooms, that was definitely a welfare, SRO, you know, single room occupancy place for people on welfare. Uh, and it was quite large. There were dozens of rooms in there. And I, I stayed there a couple times, a couple months. Uh, and I thought, this, I realized later when I read about the, the, um, the, um, the when, when they tore down all the downtown, they tore down all the, the, 
crappy bars and and hotels and apartments from downtown on Washington Avenue by Hennepin Avenue all the way down to Cedar Avenue used to be bars. It used to be bars from Washington Avenue all the way downtown. There are just little bits and pieces of it left, like where the loft is, and, uh, um, but a few buildings left, but mostly it's all ripped down and all down to Cedar and then down Cedar and then down to Minnehaha and down Minnehaha out to the railroad, really, which is now Cub Rainbow, or it was. Um, and there were bars. There were bars the whole way because in Seward, I know about this, 26 and 26 was called the hub of hell because you could stand there and see 30, 30 bars from one, you know, from one corner. I mean, it was all bars, and they're almost all gone now. The schooner is still there, and I've got some stories about the schooner too, but that, uh, that was next to the old rainbow. But that's one end, but downtown, and there's a wonderful old film that somebody took in the 60s, I think, before they did the teardown. This is all part of um, um, community, rede community redevelopment, you know, that took down a lot of Seward. Uh, they would have taken down all of Seward and took down a bunch of the West Bank, and they would have taken down all of the West Bank, except for real. Uh, and that's another part of the struggle on the West Bank that was quite interesting at that time. Uh, the, the political ferment of the tenants' union and all that, but um, other people can tell that story better. But I, I was around for that, and it was quite interesting. But all those bars and all those places then, what they had, they had, they had been housing for way back to the lumber days of the, of the Norwegian lumbermen, who I know some of them because I'm a Norwegian, uh, and, and they were all drunks out in those lumber camps, and they'd come into town and they would drink, and they would, uh, you know, they would drink up their money, and then they would live. And, but all the places they used to live are gone. Uh, so now, but there were little scraps of it left, and I got to live in some of the little scraps as a young hippie in the 70s, hippie uh, theater monk, uh, I got to live with these old drunks and their lives was just drinking, really, homeless drinking and odd jobs and, and, and weirdness, you know, there were weird little subcultures. Um, and, but I, I got to stay in those rooming houses and uh, I've always been kind of glad I got to do that. Um, but then I went to Naropa and studied Tai Chi one summer and then I came back here, and we did experimental theater. I did. I wrote. I wrote a half a dozen plays for the palace, and I was in plays that we would rehearse for months, and do a few. T uh, well, anyway, it was just. It was a tough life. I mean, the that experimental theater thing was really tough, uh, and it, it was rough. It was just hard work, and it was. There wasn't any. Um, there wasn't any payback for it in terms of. There's no social status with it. Now I see many people doing theater, and there's a lot of social, there's a whole society of it. We were really just an island of people who did this. And uh, for instance, the, the Playwright Center started up at the same time as we did in 74, because we shared, an, we shared offices in the old, in what's now the mixed blood, in the old firehouse. We had an office upstairs for our theater, and we used that rehearsal space. And we rehearsed in the basement, we rehearsed in the space, and, and the Playwright Center was just starting their office there. And so several years later, they're, they've established themselves, and they, they've got a bigger office, and they've got money, and they're giving out money to playwrights. And so we go over there as a playwrights to apply. Oh no, what you do aren't plays. You don't have scripts. And we went, well, A, we do have scripts, but B, these are plays. No, they didn't accept them as plays. And now that's all turned around, you know, it's really quite turned around, it's quite changed, um, because they accept process of script, and, uh, and that's really what we were doing at that time. Um, so then out of that, that the, the, the palace finally fell apart and the, in, the, in 84, and uh, oddly enough, Bain did the last production. I was in it, Uncle Va which was another Chekhov, Uncle Vanya, beautiful play at the Southern, uh, where we did a lot of our plays at the Southern. Um, 
because we helped save it from the Guthrie. The Guthrie had started it and then dropped it, and we w helped save it. There were a number of arts organizations got together to save that building. It really would have gone, I'm sure. Um, so then after, I just want to, I'll, I'll, I'll sweep you through the 80s, 90s, thousands with my theater process, because what happened when I cut loose of that company is I was really cut loose, uh, wondering really quite how to do plays. And so I did one-person plays, and I did various kinds of narrative plays, and then I did experimental plays. One of my experiments, I got into hypnosis very heavily. I studied hypnosis, and I did plays around hypnosis, hypnotizing the audience, because that had been an element of my plays from early on. I realized that one piece of what happens in theater is trance, stories and trance people. People sit still and they listen, and they go into another, an altered state, and that's a trance, and that's how and that's how hypnosis works. And I really studied hypnosis pretty deeply, in connection with another thread of my uh, how I'm doing what I'm doing is I was I've, I've been depressed my whole life, and I was early on, and I kind of discovered it in the army in my 20s. I went, oh, this is depression, and that's when I started reading Freud. Um, or um, and then out of that, and then later I read hypnosis, and all these things were self-help things. Um, I never did very many drugs, but I I did read a lot, and I tried practices, you know, uh, the qigong and the tai chi and the hypnosis, and and a bunch of self-help kind of things, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and an actual therapy and. Um, and writing uh, uh, as therapy, uh, writing in journals. Uh, and then I would make theater out of those. I made theater out of hypnosis, and I made theater out of uh, journals. And um, so, and then the thing I got into in the 90s that really added on to the experimental theater, which was the physical theater and the different uh, studies of psychology and hypnosis, the things that added on there was community theater. I was in a play that a guy from England did in Whittier neighborhood. I was hired as an assistant director, uh, and it was a play with 120 people, and it was from Angelico's movement in, he worked with Angelico in England, John Oram is his name, and he came here and he uh, he raised money to do a play with 120 people, and he wrote the play and directed it, and it was in a big tent <coughs> on the grounds of MCAD, uh, on the yard that used to be there, as now they've built out into it. There used to be a bigger space there. And it played for two weeks, and it had, it had, a, it had a band uh, of professional musicians, and it had a beautifully costumed... It was a big production, and it was written about... Whittier, and what he wrote about was the trucker strike of 33, which is a big historical deal. And But at, from that, I got inspired to see, oh, theater is also a community-making thing. And out of that, I started doing community theater, uh, which I did through the 90s in Seward neighborhood, into the thousands. I wrote plays for the Seward neighborhood and did theater workshops there. I wrote plays about the history of the Seward neighborhood. Uh, and I think that's a very vital part of theater, is its connection to the audience. In fact, in my ongoing argument with the Playwright Center, who didn't accept us as scripts back when we were doing what they're doing now, uh, they, call, they say, theater begins here, you know, with playwriting. Uh, and that's, that used to be their motto. And I really argue with that. I really think theater begins with the audience. I think if you have, if you get a group of people, a community of people together, no matter what they're doing, they end up doing some form of theater. Okay, and that's you know I've worked in kitchens, I worked at Al's Breakfast, and that's theater. I mean, and and the crowd there, the crowd being the the crew, and then their audience uh, makes a form of theater. And it arises quite organically out of the humor and the situation 
of cooking the food and eating the food and, uh, well, the whole show of it. You can take any community, any neighborhood, and even if it's a neighborhood that doesn't do have a theater in it, there's a theater in it because they've got some place they shop, they've got some place they walk, they've got, even if it's a very alienated apartment building, there's a form of theater which happens in the elevator, you know, where people don't look at each other. Well, that's their theater. <laughs> uh, they're looking in the mirrors at themselves or... So, wherever theater begins with the audience, with the community, and and it's best when it ri arises organically out of that community, um, and it's worst when it's when it's uh, divorced from that community. And we could name any number of theaters that get attached to forms that aren't of the community, that are of some other place from far away, where they're pretending to be a community, or where they get attached to a building, or they get attached to money, or they get attached to uh, something else, you know, other than the community of the people who are there. Um, and I, I really, that this speaks to a thing I feel in Minneapolis, or in Minnesota, I should say, there's been this wonderful flowering of theater that I've seen that has such a it's so beautiful to see there's so many kinds of theaters here. You know, you can really find anything. And they're very high quality, from the classical to the musical to the uh, experimental to the uh, student to the, I mean, it's just to the puppet. There's an incredible, uh, to dance theater. Uh, all these forms of theater have just blossomed here beautifully. and. Uh, but a bunch of it just does not fulfill the promise of those early years that I saw here. Uh, it was so promising, and it was so much, and I don't think that, well, I, I don't know entirely what it is, but because uh, there is some awfully good theater, but it uh, could be better. <laughs> and a bunch of it has divorced itself from its roots. How are we doing on time? We're fine. Okay. I'll just keep talking. I'll take you through the next couple chapters. Uh, so that covers that. This covers the 90s, covers experimental, covers the physical, hypnosis, uh, 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 community theater. And now I'm doing a form of theater. I've been doing it for a few years now. And I'm involved in my, the, my current project is called Memory memory and desire and it's another piece of a series I started 15-20 um, years ago called Life of the Artist and it's about me as the artist and it takes my real autobiographical life uh, my real life, what's happening with me for real and uh, fictionalizes it somewhat so the main character is Ben Cryocamp in memory and desire and this one I did one once when my father died I did it about my father's death I did one once when I broke up with a bit long-term relationship um, I did one once about oh about torture in 2003 when uh, Abu Ghraib and uh, W's war you know his awful uh, terrible torture policies of his which really touched me because in the army, as it happens, uh, I was trained uh, by accident as an MP. By accident, I mean I was the right height and weight and the computer. I was drafted in one of the final months of the, of the actual draft in 69, July of 69, in the Nixon's army. And I, I had my basic training in Fort Bragg and then they said, okay, you're going to be an MP now, so then you get advanced individual training, or AIT, whatever they're called, went down to Fort Gordon and became uh, an MP, uh, which all my old college buddies really thought was kind of amusing when they heard about it. Uh, during uh, Woodstock in 69, I got postcards about Woodstock. Friends went to Woodstock, but I was in basic training in Fort Bragg, um, crawling through mud. Um, so, there I was in Nixon's army, and then I became an MP, and out of that I became 
and we volunteered for this, uh, somebody broke into the into the headquarters and found out to find we were all desperate to know where we were going to be stationed. And it turns out that right as we were graduating our class over in Vietnam, a whole company of MPs had just been wiped out. They they, they just like killed they just bombed them. They killed them. All the MPs. So we knew that that's where we were headed. If, if we we're going to stay MPs, they were going to just send us over there. And uh, so when they gave us a chance to volunteer as prison guards, we all said, oh, okay, that sounds like that's a good option. We'll become prison guards. And that was the beginning of the Army had never had actual trained prison guards before that. But since they were having riots in what they call LBJ, LBJ jail, Long Bin jail in Vietnam, they were having riots. And it was because they didn't have trained prison guards. They would take the fuck-ups from the army and and make them the prison guards. Uh, so anyway, but now they were going to train prison guards. So I got to train as a prison guard, and I did train as a prison guard. And luckily enough for me, I didn't go to Vietnam, and I worked at Fort Leavenworth, where there's a big military prison uh, in Leavenworth. Uh, and so when, in 2003, that's in... 69, 71 I get out, so in 2003, 30 years later, I read that the MPs who are running a jail in Iraq in the war that shouldn't have been fought, didn't need to be fought, completely wrong, uh, and they have MPs there who are, who are just reserves, you know, they're not, they don't, they are not trained in this thing, they are working in a, in a, in a, in a jail and they end up torturing people. I saw exactly how it happened when I read the poor woman, whoever they, they nailed for it, that, you know, the word had been put down from Rumsfeld and, and Bush that torture, yeah, yeah, Cheney, you know, that, that's okay. That's okay. And so that's what they did. Plus their own, in the, the, the built-in structure of of control and sadism built into the military hierarchy uh, where you learn how to be bullies, that's how it's run. So all that fit into it and I saw perfectly well how that happened and I was just, I was extremely upset about it. And so I did a play then about uh, Ben Cryocamp, Life of the Artist, uh, called When Reason Sleeps. It was based on me studying Goya's prints of torture. He studied Los Caprichos and uh, he has prints, uh, the, the, the Terrors of War, I can't remember. Los Caprichos, he has a number of prints and in those prints he records torture that he saw in the, in the war at the time in Spain. Uh, and some of these tortures that he saw were from the Inquisition which I'm also connected to the Catholic Church. I haven't really gone into that. But uh, the Catholic Church started uh, a, a long tradition of torture with the Inquisition in Spain that led to the torture that, that, that Goya recorded. And these same tortures were tortures used in Abu Ghraib, you know, 200 years later, uh, because there is a, a subculture of sadism and torture that goes along with military control and militaristic control, uh, such as our country is suffering from right now. Um, that there's a, we've really been militarized as a, as a society. Anyway, in that play, When Reason Sleeps, Ben Cryocamp um, is an out of work actor, uh, writer, uh, and his wife is nagging him and telling him he has to get a job. And so he goes to sleep, he's studying Goya, and he applies for a job, it's a temp job, um, in the mall, hearing confessions in the mall, as a priest hearing confessions in the mall. Uh, uh, because I know Latin from my childhood days, I got the job. And the, and the nun loved me, who was, who was hiring. And so I started to hear confessions at the mall as, as my temp job in the dream. Uh, and that, but then I, get, I hear the confession of a sergeant comes in who's tortured people and he wants to confess and get absolved. 
And I, as the priest, say, I can't absolve that. <laughs> he said, you're a priest. <laughs> and I said, no, but that's bad. That's, that's actually evil. I, I don't believe in sin, but that's horrible. So I don't confess him. So he then tortures me to make me uh, forgive him for torturing. So that's, the, that, that, that's that play. And so these plays that I do are about Ben Kreilkamp, uh, having misadventures in a fictionalized version of Ben Cryocamp, which I call Life of the Artist series. And this latest play, Memory and Desire, is Ben Cryocamp imagining my own death. Uh, and that's what I'm doing in the play. And as I imagine my death, I look back on my memories um, of, of my love life. Uh, and uh, and I'm coming to terms with death through a couple of people I know who died. Uh, my mother died uh, in the last few years, and before that I had a partner who died, uh, Rini, and uh, and so it's about her a lot. And and then a couple months after she died, Franz Kamen died, and it's about him and his ideas. And he's a composer, writer experimentalist with whom I did some shows and so I'm I'm re, I'm revisiting his ideas and the notions of my love life and and what I learned about death from Rini watching her die I was with her through her diagnosis and so this play is very much about me and my life and adding it up into a uh, kind of a meditation on death I guess and on Franz Kamen's ideas and then on my mother and then on Rini and love in general. So that's the current play, and it kind of tells you how I go about doing my plays now, which is a mix. This, this series of plays uh, are a mix of, um, of journal, journal kind of writing, that is personal memory writing, and also um, editorializing issue plays about, about uh, about issues that I find of general interest. So, any questions? Uh, when, uh, now I do have a question. When, when did theater of the kind you do, and that I've always been interested in, start to be called devising? Oh, that's an interesting question. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has interested me. Uh, because I do see that that's what we we invented that I mean I'm sure it was invented before that oh, yeah. but in but when we started it in the early 70s uh, in the old Minnesota ensemble and with Jim Stoll in the Palace Theater <clears throat> we would just get in a room with a bunch of people and do physical exercises and start writing scenes and plays out of that so it's and then at some point as I say, in the 70s, people didn't accept that as theater, as plays, you know, that was, a, and then they started to accept it, and then they started to honor it as important theater, uh, when important people were doing it. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, in the thousands, I started to hear, oh, this is a devised play. I went, oh, uh, what's that? And actually, the devised plays I've seen uh, aren't as narratively, um, they aren't as written as our plays were because we always wrote plays out of all those exercises. And now the kids, as I think of them, <laughs> seem to be satisfied with doing the exercises and, 